Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. On today's episode, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Fu Jian Zane. She is a radio host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. She has her doctorate in clinical psychology and is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She has a large private practice in Beverly Hills and San Clemente, California. Her expertise lies in intimate relations and addictive behaviors. She has extensive experience in treating depression, anxiety, traumas, and domestic violence. Fujian is the originator and the author of the Awareness, Integration, Educational, and Psychological Model a multi-modality approach and intervention toward minimizing depression and anxiety while working on improving self-esteem and self-confidence. Multiple research studies have been done on this method and have been published in international journals and also presented at Harvard University. Fujian presents internationally and is a leading expert in the field of online therapy. She is the co-author of Online Therapy, A Therapist's Guide to Expanding Your Practice, published by Norton in 2005. She also has a chapter published entitled Life Coaching, in A Practice That Works, Tips and Strategies for Your Standalone Therapy Practice, also published in 2005. She published an article titled Moving Away, Moving Toward, Immigration and the Acculturation Process in Family Therapy Journal, January-February 2008. Fujian co-authored a psychological novel about intimate relationships and the self named M.A. This was published in 2014. Fujian is a contributor to your yourtango.com, divorceforce.com, yogajournal.com, wholelife.com, men's health, psychology today, reader's digest, and the Huffington Post. Fujian hosts The Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian show on KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio as a call-in consulting show where she interviews experts. She has been a guest speaker at many universities including Harvard, MIT, UCLA, USC, UC Santa Barbara, and Cal State Long Beach. She has also been a guest on the Dr. Phil show on CBS. She has been a guest on Fox and The Voice of American Television programs as as well as many other radio stations you can find out more about her at www.fujan.com that's f-o-o-j-a-n.com all right here's the episode welcome dr fujan zane to the show the intentional clinician i'm glad to have you on here Oh, I'm so excited to be with you and uh, everyone who's listening. Absolutely. And I'm really excited for the listeners to hear all about your program, the Awareness Integration Model, and your book, Life Reset. And I hope to have a great dialogue with you. Um, It was great to meet you at the Erickson Congress in 2019 in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, It was a great time that Erickson Institute puts on wonderful trainings all over the world really and some of the big ones you've heard of probably the listeners evolution of psychotherapy the couples therapy conference and the brief therapy conference but we got to go to the congress and i saw you present your model and i was very intrigued um so could you tell us maybe a little bit about um the awareness integration model and all of that of course and thank you yes um i'm so grateful to erickson um and dr zai um, because of the conference uh, that he um, actually kind of promoted um, and got me into bringing everything that I knew for the past 30 years. Um, you know, and I studied cognitive behavior. I studied all the emotional fields, um, psychodynamic, um, existential, gestalt, and uh, the behavioral models. And then I studied a lot of the trauma. I studied the EMDR and hypnosis and brought everything that I knew. And, you know, you're a therapist, you know, we bring everything we know into our, the room with our clients. And then we really get to see what's working, what element in each one of these theories or interventions are really working and what part of this is just, it's not enough maybe, or it it ends there. And then another theory kind of, or an intervention picks it up. So then I figured I'll take all the best that I, uh, for me, as I worked it with the clients and I saw it work, um, and brought them together into the model of awareness integration model. So it does take the 
approach of um, all of us obviously create our own stories. And uh, many of us go through the misery um, of uh, the way we put in the story together. And we do it, you know, since childhood. So obviously any type of experience that we have in childhood, we pick it up and we translate it into something about us and something about the world. Um, so the, from the cognitive perspective, also we do the challenges. Um, and then there's also the emotions that are becoming part of it. And then the knowledge and the awareness of those emotions, what kind of signals they're giving. Is it, is it a raw emotion that is showing up as giving us signals? Or is it just an emotion that is picking up because of the story we made? And there are actions um, and the impact that you know, our thought, our behavior, and our emotions have on, in our life and onto others. Um, so I, I started looking as I was working with people that um, there's three realms of relatedness that we do, and we always live in relationships, obviously. Uh, there is not a time that we don't live in a relationship, even if we would live in a relationship to ourselves. You know, we, obviously we could understand it by all the dialogue that we all have with ourselves, so it happens in a relationship way, mode. Um, so there's a way we relate to the world. And um, so it's important to know then become aware of how we think and feel and behave toward the world. And then we all um, develop mentally and genetically have this concept of we assume. We're constantly assuming about how other people are with us. That has been uh, set in, in our brain because we needed to be um, safe. So we needed to read people's you know, facial and body uh, expressions in order to make sure that we're safe. So our frontal cortex have kind of expanded that and we come up not only with the stories about ourselves, but we also assume and come up with a lot of stories about other people oh, yeah. and how they are and how they are with us and you know, what their intentions are about us and what are they thinking about us. And then, so therefore we also live based on that assumptions throughout the day. And then the third relationship is the one we have with ourselves. That in the, you know, how do we think of ourselves? How do we feel? And how do, what do we do to ourselves? Are we, uh, you know, nurturing to ourselves? Are we motivating ourselves? Are we punishing? Are we punitive? Uh, do we sabotage ourselves? You know, so those are the three relatedness concepts. Us to the world, assumption of the world to us, and us to us. And then you can imagine that with this three dynamic that is constantly happening within us, then we relate to the world and relate to people we don't know, you know, going to the Starbucks or driving, or we're constantly relating to people we don't know. And then we people do we know in the realm of what kind of, uh, you know, priorities of our acquaintances, family members, friends, you know, children, mates, siblings, our parents, and then we also have relationship with non-tangible concepts or um, let's say non-being, non-human concepts such as money, um, sexuality, death, uh, you know, nature, uh, God, you know. So there's also relatedness to all of that. And I noticed that when people come in, although they come in, in with one presenting issue because they have they're, they're really looking at suffering in one area and they come to therapy or coaching for that. But many times um, either the source, it really, you know, lies in another area of their life and then it kind of shows up in here or that this is the source and, but they're not really looking at how it impacts all other areas. And I'm sure you've seen like, you know, if you're, if you're having a bad relationship with your maid, it really affects your finances, it affects you know, your work, it affects everything. If you're having an issue in finances and the way you manage it constantly, it affects your work, it affects your relationship, your health. So that's how it's all interconnected. So then I decided to take the model, which is a 12 questions of awareness. And then if there is a core belief that happens and we see that a lot of this is you know, underlying from some kind of a, either a trauma or a perspective or a core belief that showed up in a childhood and is kind of like carrying itself. So we go with a, a concept that is more, um, if you could you know, call it hypnosis, you could utilize hypnosis or just focusing, going in, utilizing some of the concepts of EMDR. Um, we, we go into whatever the event was, open it up, uh, restructure it, integrate it into the system, 
and then come back and then kind of like uh, now go into the future and build an intentional future and then do this specific model, go through every single area of life or areas that are important to the person so that they can clean up. It's like a cleanup concept. And then from a place that you really get who you are, you're aware of these things and you can intentionally uh, constantly evaluate and shift um, in every area that is happening, build an intentional future that you can work toward and complete with the past and really allow yourself to live at the moment in the, in, in the here and now as you evaluate and move and experience. Oh, I really like that summary. Um, I was thinking about how you have incorporated many different schools and therapeutic approaches to be not just eclectic, but to also have a process and a framework and structure that the therapist and the client can work through while obviously addressing their core or chief concern. And then, but also bringing it beyond that to how is this affecting other areas of your life and going through um, that. And I was, when I was reading the articles about the awareness integration model, I was very impressed because as a therapist myself, I found myself drawing from cognitive behavioral. I've been EMDR trained for 11 years. I, I like all types of different therapies and sort of in that therapist way, we kind of like interweave them, as you say. And so I really enjoyed reading about this because I said, oh my gosh, well, not only does this incorporate all my favorite, some of my favorite techniques uh, throughout the model, it's also saying, hey, there's a process to this. And that's one of the things when you're working with a, a client sometimes in therapy they're always not, they're not quite sure where you're going. And the therapist sometimes isn't quite sure where they're going. They're just trying different interventions. And so if, if you have a structure and the person agrees that, yeah, I want to, I want to do this. Um, that's a very good guideline to decrease anxiety and, and increase therapeutic outcomes to say, Hey, we're going to address all of these different areas, the cognitive, the emotional, the behavioral, and we're going to use totally different types of techniques that came, you know, if we talk about going back to the beginning of therapy, all from different schools of thought about what would work, we're blending those together. Um, and then I, I really liked the, uh, the concept of living in relationships and how our subconscious, um, you know, from our framework of what, where we came from or our trauma or our life story is really impacting our relationship with the world, how we perceive the world with us, and then eventually helping the person move into a relationship with the self to integrate the awareness into their daily life. I like, I think it's very thorough uh, as, a, as a model. Thank you. One of the things you just said, it reminded me, and I sometimes I still have this, which um, I'm sure you and other therapists have experienced this and the clients where, you know, the first session when people come in, usually we go through a history and <clears throat> they let us know who they are. And um, based on that, we, kind of come up with an assessment together, what we should work on, what the goals would be for our work together and our relatedness. And then obviously there are sessions that we do and maybe, you know, even if you go with a brief model, you'll go between six sessions to maybe eight sessions of, you know, working on symptomology or the core concepts. But like you said, many times, then, you know, the, th the client comes in and says, well, I don't know what to say or I don't know where to go. And sometimes, a lot of times, even therapists, like you say, they sit through and waiting for the client to come in with something new in their life, but how many new stuff happens in somebody's life? And I notice exactly what you said when the client knows exactly where, what areas we're going to cover, and um, they're waiting for it. And they, I found that a lot of people do much more homework at home, um, so it extends the therapy session and awareness because. Um, I request from them that whatever we work, uh, you know, to get kind of get really tuned in the awarenesses of the distinction between their thoughts, emotions, and behaviors and how they are with different groups. So that week, particularly when they're working, for example, with people or acquaintances or their mate or child, they're really hyper-focused in awareness of what's going on. And sometimes they do a lot more journaling and, you know, when they come back, they're ready. And it's funny, I had one incident where one of the clients uh, in between, obviously she came about 10 minutes before and she was sitting in the lobby 
And um, so when I asked her to come in, she says, I'm already done, Fujian. I'm like, what? She said, I already came and sat. And I figured I've already observed all of these things about my relationship with my child. I sat there, went through all the questions with myself. I saw that it was this core belief. I went in, I went to my memory. I did everything you taught me. And then I decided what I'm going to do with my child. I'm ready. I already done it in 10 minutes. So I guess I don't even need to be here. We started laughing. And I think part of what it was intriguing for me is that the client felt um, confident in that they really had a tool, that no matter what happens in their life, they can bring this tool, utilize it, and move out of it and do that, which sometimes when we do therapy, which is the client really doesn't know what's going on in the in the world of the therapist and all the interventions and techniques they're using, they're always dependent on uh, the therapist, where this model awareness integration also creates independent um, clients because they get, get, they get the interventions to be able to do it on their own. And this doesn't mean they don't come back because you know people always come back for new skills. People always come to therapy. I have clients who are with me for 20 years, not because they need therapy, because they love the one hour that is just the clear and crisp listening of their world, which they might not have that. So they, it's not like you know therapists should be worried that they're going to lose their clients because the, you know the um, the beauty of the essence of the relationship that gets created of love and acceptance within that. Um, I mean, people love to come in and, and explore who they are constantly. But at least it goes away. It, it takes therapy from a problem-oriented concept and a medical model and then shifts it into a growth prospect and just people wanting to thrive and constantly like exploring themselves and uh, having a bounce off of a mirror with their, their, with their therapist or coach. Yeah, I really like that. I... I think that it's empowering the client to see this as everyone has their own different story that's unique, obviously, and that they'll come into you and we'll talk about that. And there's so many difficulties and people do need to be heard in a therapeutic way that we really can't reproduce outside of a a meeting and a human relationship. However, giving them and empowering them with all these tools and saying, hey, you're I've gone through this model. Other people have gone through this model. You can you can do these things at home. You can help yourself. It's giving them um, more confidence, more resources, and kind of an edge to be able to start navigating things. Because that's one of the hardest things about therapy, depending on where, what kind of therapy you're doing. Um, but some people come in so wounded that it takes them months before they're possibly even ready to start implementing some of the skills or new ways of being or new ways of relating to people in the world outside of therapy. And so if we have them, I guess, giving them homework and resources or a book or a guideline like this model and these questions, um, it, it, it kind of gives them, Hey, you know what, just in case here's, here's something you can do. And for those people that are maybe just ready, like I need to change this. I, one hour a week is not enough for me. I need to come see you and I need to, I, I want to be doing something. I'm, I'm tired of living this way. It gives them the tools as well. So I do think, I think it's very ethically, very, I don't know how do you say this, ethically sound because it's, it's giving them the tools they need and it's revealing what you're doing. So Scott Miller always talks about um, how rapport is so important but then, and allegiance, but then, and the alliance, but part of what he's talking about with the alliance is that the therapist and the client both agree that the therapist model is useful and and productive for them. So if the client doesn't believe that the model is good for them and they don't know what the model is, for instance, maybe a therapist who's a little bit more psychodynamic, um, well, I don't, I think we all are in some ways, but where it's just a little bit more like here's the relationship and what you do in this relationship is kind of how you live in other relationships. And I'm going to give you feedback on that. It's not as structured and not to say that that's wrong. There's lots of people that love that model, but in some ways, some clients could get very confused if they aren't given, what is this supposed to be doing? You know, like, thanks for the insight, but what am I supposed to be doing? What, where is this going? 
So I, I love that. It, it really speaks to the alliance. Like, hey, I'm not, I'm not doing any tricks behind the curtain here. I'm telling you exactly what we're going to do. And then it, experientially, we'll go through it together. And so the experience is where people can really test it out and they can really see that change and feel differently. The feeling, the felt sense, and then if you can feel differently, um, you might be able to bring that out into your life and think differently, behave differently as well. So I love that. And then, um, yeah, what are your thoughts about that? Um, what I liked also about what you said about the structure, uh, the structure leads and guides and holds like a containment, a containing all that we go. And then yet it's not rigid. It is open enough that I've had a client come in and say, I know that we're supposed to be working on, you know, this area of my parents, but uh, this week, uh, this happened for me, which, uh, you know, at my work, my boss did this. And I don't want to do that structure. I want to work on this today. And it's open enough that, you know, you don't say, no, I'm going to go through this structure. You know, it's like, of course, you know, we, we put that aside. We really work on whatever it is that it's needed at that moment and then move forward. Or even within the structure, if they're going through the questioning of, you know, how they think and feel and their relatedness and the impact, and then we find uh, a belief system that is done, you know, that it's about something that, that you know, they believed in about when they were five years old and uh, some trauma had happened. And I've had client that says, I don't want to go there. I'm too raw this week. That's just not where I want to go. And obviously our, uh, what we do is, of course, you know, it's a client centered, although it's structured, but it's truly a client centered model where the structure is, is what the, the therapist works through and the client also knows. But they also know that any time they can, it's like a train ride or a car ride that you go. And at any time you can get off, you know, have a, go to another city, you know, hang out, have enjoy, then come back and sit in the car and still go to where you're supposed to go. So it allows that flexibility. Another point I also... It was very important for me because I come from a background and my own uh, experience that I was, you know, um, I came from a, the parents who were divorced. I was sexually molested for many years. I immigrated very young to this country and I had to take care of myself. And I remember that when, you know, the beginning when I went to the therapy world and I went to a therapist, it had to do because I was in my marriage, my marriage wasn't working. So for the first time, my, my, the door opened for me to go to therapy. And I remember that when the therapist explored all of my background, the way that I perceived as a client, that it really, really got me to feel like I was really a victim. And uh, the validation of all of these pieces took me, and I know that many of my clients and things that we talk about, and we actually had, you know, Bill O'Hanlon in, in there talking about this, where, you know, at times you really become, oh my God, I was such a victim. And then it was my parents, you know, fault. And I'm going to be raging about them now. Oh, it's all of the perpetrators and I will be raging on them. And that, although sometimes is a part of therapy, obviously validation is obviously taking care, but never, never moved out of that concept of, yes, you were victimized at one point, but you got to get out of the victimization, you know? So part of what was important for me was also bring this concept into the model of the um, responsibility and accountability of how we uh, create our world, how we, you know, perceive things. And even when the trauma comes in, what is the difference between someone who has a trauma, who's been in a war, who's been molested, who's been abused, and one person creates a story within themselves that, you know, hypes up their resiliency, and another person creates a story which keeps them victimized and completely, utterly helpless and hopeless throughout life. So it was also important for me to work with people so that it brings their resiliency out, that they really looked at that they're not the victim of the world unless they make themselves the victim of the world. And it's not that at times we don't get victimized. That's just, I think, you know, it's a nice, 
that kind of, you know, gets shot up for all of us mm-hmm. at different points in different type of world. And there isn't anyone in the world that cannot say I've been victimized at one point. Um, but how am I responsible to live beyond the, the trauma? How am I responsible to get myself out and, you know, make myself in a way that I'm strong and I utilize my strength? And a lot of this questions about how do you think and feel and behave and what is the impact? that that type of thinking, feeling, and behaving does in your life and others is to create that concept of the responsibility and accountability about how do I make up my world and how do I co-create this world uh, with, you know, in, in action as I intended to be a particular one. And I also think this is an important part of um, this and important part of how after clients come out, of the the series of the model, they really feel empowered. And obviously, you know, with the studies you learned, we've done already three studies and we keep doing more studies. I think part of the reason that it shows up as minimizing depression, you know, 76%, anxiety, 64%, and raising self-esteem and self-efficacy has to do with this essence of really coming to terms with, I'm powerful enough, to ruin my life and I'm powerful enough to make my life and which one I'm choosing at every moment, you know, the horror stories that I create Um, and then finding the patterns of those and then bringing myself back into the space that I can see what is it that I want, what is it that I intend to have and what kind of thinking, what kind of emotions and what kind of behaviors will actually get me toward what I'm saying I want. Versus the way that maybe I'm thinking, behaving, and feeling right now keeps putting me back into creating the past versus, no, no, all the type of thinking and feeling and behavior has to change so much if I'm saying that I don't want this and I want something else. So I think that's also an element. Well, I I really love that you said that. And thank you so much for sharing some of your personal story um, in this interview. Uh, I believe that can be very inspiring to other people that have gone through anything in their lives that was very difficult. So I appreciate your openness about that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, when, when, let's just say, let's just use trauma as an example. When trauma strikes, it is normal to feel lots of terrible things. And one of those could be, I'm a victim. And that is true. And we have to validate that because if you don't get validated, you can start thinking you're crazy, you know, and that you're and then it's all because of your fault or whatever, whoever's fault it is. Uh, but eventually, you're right. We have to help the person find their personal power. We have to help the person get into the present because combining trauma with all the side effects of post traumatic stress disorder, there's also the depression components. And the depression components are looking backwards. It's always about the backstory, it's always about my past story. And how do we help that person start evolving into going, how do I even make decisions that will help me in the future? How do I even have hope that I can do that? How can I be present? And how can I change my personal story to have the ending and have the middle and have the bridge that I want versus I have to subscribe to this model because I was victimized? And the same thing goes for anxiety, which is another a large component of post-traumatic stress or any sort of trauma, is I'm afraid of what's, of what's going to happen and I'm afraid to make decisions. So I love that this model really brings in that element of responsibility. So even though all these things happen to me and all these that were out of my control and not my fault, okay, let's heal from that. And at the same time, you don't just heal like a snap. You know, it takes time to heal and you will probably still be healing for years to come. So how do I want my life to look like now? And I, I don't know what, where, (laughs) I, I don't know if that's just a mindfulness element or something you came up with, but it's, it's really about a kind of a, a reality test. Like, how am I living out my story? And, and if, I, if I choose a certain label for my story, that label is static. That label is, is in a time frame um, versus I'm an evolving human being having an experience, which is a non-static and it's flexible. And I don't have to live every day feeling and thinking the same way. And it takes practice because then you go into neurobiology. I know that you're a big fan of Dan Siegel and out of UCLA and, um, you know, starting to help your, your brain actually start programming these positive new 
intervention so that becomes more of a habit versus the depression, anxiety, traumatic effects being the predominant habit slash symptom that your brain is doing unconsciously. Um, so I really like that part of that because I do think that, you know, as a therapist in the therapist community, I think we do a great job at validating people, hopefully, and helping them get skills and helping them move and try to change their narrative. But sometimes it's really hard to get to the work of, okay, now what? How do you want to be now? What about now? Versus um, staying, I, I mean, challenging the symptoms and challenging the barriers that we've put up in our own mind, whether it was our fault or not that they're there. Um, really just going, okay, now what? I love that uh, part of this therapy because I found that to be a very challenging part of being a therapist. When is the right time to bring that up? And if it's already set in a loose framework, people know that that's coming. Kind of like in EMDR therapy, when you get to the future templates, which is really hard to get to, it's like phase seven or eight. And you're like, okay, well, this is how you used to react. Now, when this thing happens, how do you react? Well, it takes a long time to get there. So um, I, I appreciate that about your model. So I think that the, when you were talking about how, how I got to that piece, I think side by side, um, I've been going to um, uh, self-progress uh, seminars, which uh, they're usually taken off from uh, existential models and gestalt models. And, um, you know, they're, they're done in more like a group setting, right? Like I've yes. gone to MITs, I've gone to Landmark, I've gone to courses, a lot of those, so side by side by therapy. And it's such a different approach because I think most of the self-progress and coaching approaches are very much um, into the future mode and what do you do right now in order to get there. And a lot of the therapy models are much more about, you know, present moments in the past. And, um, they're very different in those. So I had uh, the privilege of really learning from the two worlds and then going into yoga and meditation and really coming into like being in the present moment, looking at, you know, your thoughts that just pop and kind of move and then pop, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then just pop and then move. And you, you really get to see the, the biology of your thoughts and emotions and things that happen inside of you when you're not, you know, you're just paying attention to it. And then what I notice is most people, um, you know, the reflect uh, somewhere around like mid twenties or thirties. Um, start beginning to reflect because we're just kind of like looking outside of ourselves and then goal oriented. We're going to the next level, next level, next level. And then we have all of these fantasies that when I grow up, it's going to be like that. And then, you know, when I grew up, it wasn't. And even for me, I mean, I remember I said to myself, by age 30, I'm going to be married. I'm going to have my business. I'm going to have my house. And then by age 28, I did. I got it, but I was miserable. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, I got everything I said I want and I'm totally miserable and I was very depressed. So it was like really looking at, so it isn't about, oh, let me get what I want and I'll be happy. It's, it's really seeing how do I even say I want something and where does that come from? That Why do I want a house or why do I want this? And is it a societal concept? Is it that I'm supposed to get there? But, but what is it inside of me that motivates me? And I think those part of um, reflection is important where we're not trained to do that in anything uh, that we grow up, like our education system, our parenting systems, none of that is, is toward that. And I'm grateful for the mindful um, you know, communities such as Dan Siegel, such as so many of other ones, Alan Shore and everyone else around uh, you know, the world, East and West, that are broad bringing is beginning to bring this for children. Um, I know I was listening to Sam Harris's um, Waking Up uh, podcast, and he was talking about his wife actually starting to do meditation for children. Um, and then I have Eileen Manukian, which in one of the daycares she created, which just does the model that I am doing. Um, so because we decided, because nobody comes up with this as children are growing, why don't we bring this as an educational and a proactive model, not just as a reflective model where you've gone through the trauma, now you come to therapy. But what if 
this becomes part of the educational system? What if this is part of how parents actually teach their children um, to distinguish between their thoughts and emotions and behaviors, to distinguish, to create that type of an emotional regulation for them, to name the emotion and then be with it and, you know, kind of like uh, allow themselves to just breathe through the emotion and uh, not just give them some food and let them avoid it, but to actually for the child to experience this. So I think that more and more of the mindfulness, the emotional regulation piece, the intention and how to create it, this essence of responsibility and accountability is part of actually raising a child, raising a human being. Then, you know, hopefully a lot would shift. And uh, we're bringing that. So as I did this model with actually, it was interesting that um, some a, a person who wanted to go through this model went through it. She stated that she really changed her life because she was almost suicidal and changed her life. And then she went around the world and came back and said, I want to have a daycare. Because I, my life is about children. So she opened her daycare and she decided that she wanted to do this model actually from an educational model. So we're also doing a lot of work toward uh, bringing the therapeutic model into the educational system. And we're trying to also take it into universities in um, the group of the uh, freshmen and uh, sophomores, because as you know, that group has the highest amount of depression and anxiety and has the highest amount of uh, attempted suicide. So um, when we did the uh, research in Cal State Long Beach, just by doing the book, no therapy, for 13 weeks, um, I only went to the classes just to explain the model. And then from there, there were two um, professors, uh, four classes, altogether 130 students. Um, Every week, they would give them one of the modules. They will go work at it at home, right? Come back and give it to the teacher. And then the next module would be given. And um, 13 weeks because that was their semester. And it was astonishing that with no therapy, we got 64% minimization of depression. Oh my goodness. And that's Beck's inventory. Like we didn't create our own, uh, you know, we utilize standard, standardized pre-test and post-test, which was Beck's uh, inventory of depression and anxiety. And the pre-test and post-test, just doing the book, Life Reset, which was given to them as a module, coming back, doing the work on their own, coming back. They didn't even process because the classes were not about processing. This was only individual works on them. It was astonishing, 64% minimization of depression. And it was like 40 some um, of anxiety. I don't have the numbers and their surface theme raised. Um, so we're also trying to go into universities and attempt to put this now as a class by itself. So that, you know, when their kids are coming and it's right where they're going from childhood to really adulthood that they have access to this type of a tool and to get a whole different view of who they can be uh, and clean up the past and how to think and be in the future. So that's, you know, fingers crossed. That's where we're also trying to take it. Well, I really admire that because I, I remember, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, just having this thought, and I'm sure lots of people have had this thought, including yourself, which was, Okay, so I went through school and I learned all these skills and all these subjects, but it was mostly geared towards productivity in the workplace and or trying to gain knowledge and education and information. There was almost nothing in my entire education about uh, self-esteem, friendships, relationships, how to deal with your parents, how to deal with money, how to deal with self-esteem. Um how to deal with bullies. I know that's a new thing people are doing now. Absolutely no mindfulness of any type <laughs> whatsoever and any awareness at all. It was just sort of, it, it's about, it, it kind of goes along with the way American society has been. I think hopefully it's starting to change, which is get more, gain more, uh, be more at winning. You know, these sort of concepts kind of trickled down in the education system. And I thought, 
why don't we have a class in every school that just teaches people about basic, even just basic things like emotions? How do you have a friend? What is boundaries or what are boundaries? Uh, what, how do you deal with a parent or a caregiver? Um, what are ways to communicate? Uh, nothing. There's nothing like that. Uh, at least in my school system in my school is a top rated public school. Uh, so I don't, <laughs> I know that now we have mindful schools, which I've, I've been very excited about mindful schools uh, doing that. But um, I don't think as far as I know, mindful schools is sort of an elective thing. And it's not like put in every classroom. It's sort of like certain parents will say, oh, you should, you, I want my kid to do mindful schools program. So I'm very excited about your work of bringing life reset, uh, the awareness integration model into colleges. Absolutely. I mean, as you said, it's an epidemic of depression uh, going on in colleges. And I don't know the latest rates, but uh, there's an epidemic of depression and anxiety in teenagers. And in fact, um, I read the other week, and this is in one of my other podcasts, so I'm not quoting the exact statistic, but suicide is now the second leading cause of death um, for people between the ages of 16 and 30, something like that, 16 and 32, which is just outrageous. So people are not seeing a future. They're, um, they they there's a, a lot of uh, anxiety about uh, money and uh, wh what kind of jobs they're going to look like in the future. Um, how, where am I going to live? These sort of things going on. And there's a lot of products being sold and things that are quick fixes and not a lot of integrative or long form uh, processes. And so I think the education system owes it to the public to be able to provide long form because 13 weeks personal work of some type that is educational about the self and because that's prevention. And if we have prevention, we don't have to wait for everyone to have an existential crisis, a psychotic break, a drug and alcohol problem, a relationship problem, whatever. I mean, people go through problems anyway, but we don't have to wait for a crisis to finally intervene. The suicide hotlines calls are going up by hundreds of thousands in the last three or four years. Uh, uh, and so I think it's about time that education starts integrating a little bit of education about the self and about what we know from science and what we know from therapy to, yeah, I guess I would, I would, uh, I think people will still come to therapy. I'm, <laughs> I would love that that was the case. So I appreciate you doing that because I think it's well needed in this, um, in the United States and everywhere really. But I mean, especially right here where we live. One of the things that I noticed when you were talking also, and I, I've noticed this a lot in my practice. Um, I also have worked a lot with teens and obviously parents and, uh, the, um, epidemic aspect of teens around now age 12 and 13 having not only full access but becoming completely addicted to uh, nicotine and uh, marijuana mm -hmm. and uh, right at the place that you know their brain is really getting uh, made let's say <laughs> developed and um, now I have people who are age 15 and they're already coming and, well, you know, having addiction issues and they realize that they have addiction issues and um, none of them really knew how to handle emotions, um, how to contain their emotions. And, you know, the anxiety that was there, plus obviously the availability and the peer pressure is really getting them to go into that route. So now you have people who are coming to colleges, which they've already been addicted, their brain uh, chemistry has really been changed for three to four years. And then colleges itself has become the conversation of, you know, party towns. And so then you, you go freely now with alcohol and all sorts of drugs. So by the time you're about 25, um, you can imagine how much, you know, having now to enter the world while you're, brain has been hijacked with mind altering substances and this concept of even already feeling powerless that I can't even control myself. Um, what about the, you know, what's going to happen to the world? It's, um, it's really scary for people and rightly so, rightly so. Um, so that's why I also think the, you know, the mindfulness aspect of it, to the responsibility and accountability, having a tool uh, would really support 
uh, kids to be able to have the tools inside their hand, which it's not like, okay, I'll, I'll give up. Now, what do I do with all my anxiety? They don't have no idea. They have no tools in how to handle, you know, the emotions that are happening. And every day in that something new shows up for them. Um, you know, the teens today have to go through a lot more than what I remember having to go through, you know, the worriness of somebody having a gun, uh, the shootings in the school, the, the drug, the alcohol, the sexuality, which before it used to be, you know, they would have to go through the stress of sexuality maybe later on in the, you know, and now they have to face this pretty much at age 10, 11, 12 with YouTube and, you know, uh, porn and um, people asking each other or asking each other to put like nude photos in, in, um, social media and then bully each other. So everything that somebody used to go through maybe much later in life, the kids are having to face much earlier in life with no tools in how to handle it. So that's why I also, like you said, really uh, love for this model or you know something that shows, uh, it, that becomes part of the educational model in how to handle, how to do appropriate decision-making, how to, uh, you know, evaluate things, how to handle your emotion. All of those, I think, sh sh need to be the, the self-awareness concept and ref self-reflection, um, communication skills. All of those have to be something that are brought into the schools. Absolutely. I'm really, yeah, I really think we're definitely in agreement on that. And I think there's a lot to be done there. So, I, I mean, I always hope these podcasts reach people that are, have influence in the school system to really take in, this into account. Um, I wanted to know, uh, before we talk about, I want to I want to talk a bit about the research, about your your project and how people could get involved in bringing that. But I, I was wondering if, would you share a little bit about how you came to become a, a therapist and a healer and a coach and a consultant and all of that? Oh, of course. Um, as I said, I came here uh, to the U.S. when I was 12 and then um, um, went to high school and then went to, to university and I did, you know, my bachelor's degree and all of that. And as I said to you, you know, I gained everything that I wanted. And at one point it was like, OK, I'm not happy. So then I, in two layers, um, I went to a marriage counseling. So I opened, opened the door for me to therapy world. And then side by side, one of my friends was going to a self uh, kind of actualization type of a seminar. Uh, it was called Bonyan at that time. So I just went to that. And then I think both of these brought these concepts for me of um, the awareness of who I was, how I had created my life so far, and what were my thought process and my patterns? So that brought me into that. And then I fell in love with this for so, so much that I decided I wanted to go back to school. And then I went and got my master's in um, psych clinical psychology with the emphasis of marriage and family therapy license. And, um, and then from there on, it's just been, let's say, the love of my life and the passion, just the privilege of you know, being in, you know, allow people allowing you to be in their world and, you know, together coming up with solutions and, you know, ways that people heal and, and move forward. It's just been amazing. And then after that, um, I decided to go back and got my ID. Um, and then the, the, the love of this was just that every time I would, any kind of new um, seminars or lectures or type of you know, models showed up, I definitely wanted to go and learn. So like when I learned EMDR to me it was like magical. I mean, I just call it magical, you know, cause it does, it like, it does things that I've never had the experience of doing. When I learned hypnosis from, you know, the Michael Yapko, you know, Yapko. Oh yeah. Uh, I went through his hundred hours and his spectacular and I've done, you know, other trainings with Zyg and other just for hypnosis. And to me, it's like magical, you know, I had uh, one, uh, one client who came in and she couldn't go through dentistry because she would get allergies all over. So it was right after when I went to Michael Yapko's courses. And then uh, it's interesting how universe works. This, this, the, her mother called me and she said, I heard, you know, you do hypnosis. I said, yes. And she says, well, my, my daughter can't go through an operation and cannot go through actually dentistry at all. Can you help her? I'm like, okay. So, <laughs> 
she came in and then we did all of the, you know, like how you freeze your hand with your mind and then you put it and then you numb your mouth. You know, when you're going through training, you're like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. <laughs> it really worked. I mean, I was like flabbergasted. I was standing there with the dentist, with her. I mean, I went through like eight sessions of her in the dentistry. Uh, I worked with women who were, um, you know, giving birth. And to me, these things are just magical, you know. Um, so I just got very excited about all of these um, the things that I was learning and bringing to the clients. And I remember sitting actually in the evolution of psychotherapy and uh, talking to Zyg, and I kept listening to people who had created models and all of that. And then I thought, why don't I bring the 30 years or like, you know, by that time it was like 20 years of things that I constantly have learned and bring them in to see what works. And that's how I started uh, with bringing that conversation. That's why I said, uh, you know, I'm always in that with, uh, with Dr. Zyg because it was at the evolution of psychotherapy and sitting with people who are masters of, of, of this and listening to them and then saying, well, how can I bring the best of what I learned together? and brought it together. And I started, I was supervising. I had an agency with about, you know, 30 therapists and it was a multicultural, multilingual agency that I ran for a while. Um, and uh, I started working with the therapists who were working there. Um, and then I started working with the model, with my clients, and then for them to work with the clients and then started, you know, kind of like logging in how the effect was and how, what the impact was. And that's how the first study actually started, that we did it at Personal Growth Institute when we were all doing it together and look at the before and afters and what would work. And, um, and actually, I used a lot of the, um, Scott Miller's uh, sheets of all of that for, throughout the whole agency. We did that almost for four years to look at exactly what type of therapy modules were working and not working. And um, that's how it kind of like it all started. Um, and then after the first, uh, pu first study was published, then a friend who taught at uh, Boston University called me and she said that she was just getting a divorce and she was in a group of a divorced, uh, divorce group, men and women. And she said, can you come to Boston for a weekend and do your model for us? And, uh, and then we will put it as a study. We'll do the before and a test and then see what it is. And then, so I did, I went there and um, we sat with a group, we talked about the divorce conversation, however, and we only um, worked on the divorce and their relationship and relationship with their parents and children. So it was just those uh, areas of life. Same thing, two days, uh, we did this. And um, again, it was published with astonishing results. Again, like bringing down 76% of uh, depression, 64% anxiety. And basically so far, we've only measured this depression, anxiety, self-esteem um, and self-efficacy, raising those two and minimizing the two. Um, until another colleague who was working at the Cal State Long Beach, uh, we started talking about what if we do it for students and not do it in the therapy world. And that was right when I was writing my book, Life Reset, which is written as a self-help book. Uh, it said, let's, let's look at how self-help model works if it's not done in actually a therapy world. So the, the, the three uh, research have been done in a therapy world, in a workshop mode, and in a self-help. So, so far we have those. Um, that's how it all started. I really appreciate that story. I wanted to give uh, a little bit of context to this. And I think that you've really taken a lot of your personal passion and your love for helping people and, and being involved and used your talents to weave this together. I'm curious, um, are you reaching out or having, and you maybe can't tell everyone yet, it might not be public, but are you working on maybe trying to get some other people to do some research studies to, uh, besides, I, you know, I guess, I guess the university is maybe bringing this in as a class, which is amazing. I would love that. Um, but are you wanting more people to try to research your model? Anything like that? Absolutely. Right now I'm, I'm uh, finishing up the book, which is a manual for therapists, uh, which actually teaches the therapist exactly how to deepen um, all of this, especially, you know, the process of going and reintegrating and healing the past and coming back and moving forward and all of this. this um, uh, so the, it's, it's deepening concepts that I'm writing. Um, 
the 11 chapters are written, I actually sent it to uh, the therapists that I uh, had trained uh, in this model and I wanted them to go over it. And I sent it to four of the clients who had gone through this and they said that they wanted to read the book. They know that this is toward the therapist, but they wanted to read it and see if I missed. This is Mm -hmm. like, we experience things and we want to make sure that those experiences are in there. Um, so I'm waiting for that. So hopefully that should be published either by the end of this year or next year. Um, I am so excited if, if people who want to, um, do more of, um, the research on different realm, as I said, we just kind of looked at the depression, anxiety. So if they want to look at the model from other aspects, um, and I'll definitely help people if people are interested to do it, whether they're in universities or clinics, um, they're interested in doing that. I will support them fully in creating, um, the whole study with them. Um, and on diff- uh, for different population. I remember one, uh, I was, um, lecturing, I think in, um, American association of marriage and family, therapist and a therapist came and said have you ever worked with autism and autistic children and I said I don't I haven't but I'd be so glad if you do and let me know and a week later she emailed me and she said my god I have five kids who are in my caseload and I already started working with them and I'm getting such an amazing result again I told her like you know if you can create with your school a system that we could do uh, testing on different population um, I love to, I love to be able to support, uh, you know, kind of like give this away, like just let it, let it run its course and see where it, where it's applicable, where it's working and how it can work and side by side, as we talked about in the educational system. So whether it's in the clinical world or in the educational system, anyone who could contact me and, you know, I'll be all uh, to, to be able to do that. We were also looking at doing some um, work with the treatment programs. There's one treatment program that is getting set up and, um, you know, as they get set up and they get all their license and we're supposed to have this model be the model that they work. So obviously with that, we'll do some testing. Um, so yes. And thank you. Thank you for sharing that and, and allowing me to let the world know that we're ready to go if they are. I love it. Yes, absolutely. And I will be definitely paying attention to your newsletter. And when that manual comes out, I will be one of your first purchasers because I love having the structure. And since it weaves together so many of the things I've already done, I would love to have it in my clinic um, where I supervise multiple therapists and try to help them with their skill set as well. And um, yeah, I don't really know many people in the school system, but if I do meet anyone, I, I feel like this would be a perfect course. So I'll be contacting you about that as well. Um, I want to respect your time. I wasn't sure how much time you had today. Um, but okay. So I was wondering, is there, is there anything you wanted to kind of share to the listeners who are not clinicians, um, who are out there? And maybe they're in therapy or maybe they're not in therapy and any sort of uh, words or quotes or, or something about how they can either help themselves or get involved with a healer. Um, Absolutely. I think everyone uh, uh, deserves to live a happy life. We all have the capacity. We have the tools in our mind to be able to do it. And um, I think that when we take the responsibility about This is my life. I only live it once. Even for people who think they keep coming back in reincarnation, they're only going to live this life once. (laughs) So that's true. uh, You know, it's important for us to take some responsibility about this one. And uh, wherever and whatever age that they are, I think that it's important for um, for us to have that type of a reflection. And um, the life reset has been set up as a self-help and it gives all of the tools which is talked about in it in a systematic way it's easy to do they can just you know go through it and own uh, own it um i still do believe that no matter how much we learn the tools and reflect and no matter how much we have the meditation you know of looking at ourselves i still do think that reflection externally with someone who is clean in their listening, 
crisp in their listening and they're there for you and they'd have no uh, agendas about their relatedness to you um, really, really helps us um, see things. Um, see, you know, looking at uh, our shadow side. You know, when we look at a mirror, I can't, if I don't, let's put it this way. If I don't look at a mirror, I'll never know what my face looks like. I just won't. Like I could touch it, I can imagine it, but I won't know what it looks like. So the mirror does that for me. And if imagining people, if they choose a therapist or a coach, uh, someone who it's, and I'm, I, they could have a friend or a family member, it's just friends and family member usually have an investment in that type of a relatedness. You know, they don't want to hurt you or they don't, or they'll have expectation of you. There's so many other things that would get convoluted or they will tell you what's best for them and you know they don't want to lose you so if don't do if you don't do exactly what they told you then they'll get upset because they think you didn't you know to carry over what they said so there's so much inside those relationships that if you you can't have a clean mirror when you do it with a friend and a you know um, family member let's say and i'm not saying not share with your friends and that family member but i'm saying that once in a while whether it's a weekly monthly whatever you know, I have, I have clients who have done, completed everything, but they do what they call a monthly tune-up. And that's all. Everything in their world is working. But they still come in just to hear themselves more than anything out loud and have it out. So if there are areas that I see that maybe they didn't catch or is their shadow side or, oh, look at that duality that showed up, then all I do as a mirror is just to say, oh, that's interesting. Look at this duality that showed up or look at this or look at this growth like you haven't even noticed. My God, you have grown so much. And that's why I think, of, you know, having this relationship with someone else um, is that it's important for everybody's growth. Um, so if they if they like to do it on their own, you know, Life Reset gives them all the tool. If they like to have that and still work with someone, then. Um, they have the tools, but come in and just kind of like brainstorm with another, what I call a clean ear and listening. I really like that explanation for participation and counseling and, um, and yeah, exactly. Having somebody without an agenda who is just trying to be there as a reflective listener, it's something that cannot be explained unless you've done it. And so, and had that, had that experience. And so we've all read books and we've tried to change our lives based on quotes we've read and we, and you can, and journaling and, you know, self studies, you've seen, we've seen the results, even with your program in the college and so many other uh, programs people have done, but there is something to that extra fine tuning that is only available in a relationship um, with somebody who's studied and worked to become a, a therapist. And a, and a counselor. So I also wanted to add this, as you were saying, I remember that when I was doing this model also, um, it was interesting because I would keep doing it with myself. And um, there were areas that would only work when I was teaching other therapists. And then in order to teach them, I would become the client. Oh. And it's interesting that the past traumas I couldn't do that to myself. I couldn't heal myself. Mm -hmm. It had to be a space, a person in front of me that I could allow my trust to be there. So I would get to be my complete vulnerable self in order to heal through that vulnerability. And so I also want to share that I think on a deep level, even if they go through the Life Reset book, that if they've had a really, really deep trauma uh, or childhood issues that they have to have, sometimes by themselves, it doesn't get all released and healed. We sometimes do definitely need a person in front of us that we could allow them to be the adult for us to completely you know, kind of like take all of it out and, and be vulnerable and be the child and, uh, you know, uh, have the catharsis and all of it. And then claim back our adult and go in. 
Um, but I've noticed even when I was, you know, I created this the system, but even when I wanted to be both hats of my adult and my vulnerable and child side, it just didn't work. So that I think, you know, um, say, you know, uh, give a lot of credit to our field of uh, the therapy. And I think that's what it does. That's the healing. Um, whether it's done in a group work or whether it's done in an individual work, I think that dynamic really works with other people. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And the research definitely backs that up. The research on the trauma therapies are amazing and just blowing our, even our former results, which were great, out of the water. So that threat research is still forthcoming on the trauma-informed and EMDR type therapies and integrated therapies like what you're doing. And in the old models, just the talk therapy, um, Bruce Wampold's work showed that 79% of people felt um, much better. And there was, you know, Likert scales to prove this, but like significantly better and less depressed, less anxious, all of that with just talk therapy after only about six to to eight sessions. Um, And so that effect size is 0.8, which is um, more than aspirin. you know, the effectiveness of aspirin. So uh, that is in Bruce Wampold's book. Um, I think it's called The Great Psychotherapy Debate. But that was just on talk therapy, as far as I know, maybe a little bit of integration, but that was that was that book's over 20 years old. So now we've got all these new um, methods to integrate the talk therapy with the experience of really getting in and understanding trauma, which is just in the, since the 90s, exploded understanding trauma and the nervous system, understanding trauma and the story and the narrative, understanding trauma and the way it affects your subconscious and your and your behaviors and your emotions. And I believe, I completely agree with you. I've been able to make some really cool goals with my journaling and my reading and all of that. But in terms of really healing some of these you know, traumas that were underneath that I didn't even realize maybe were influencing my behavior, all of that's been done in with my own therapist um, working on um, models that uh, integrate the trauma informed paradigm. So I can't explain it because it's again, one of those things you've got to experience. So if you're out there and you have not worked with somebody who is, has a trauma informed or integrated model um, it's definitely worth your time to seek that, that out. Um, I'm sure at some point the awareness integration model will have a website that it will show people that are fully trained in your, in your therapy. Uh, that's coming soon. Uh, until then, you know, that type of therapy, uh, a lot of his EMDR obviously is a, is a, uh, one that's quite famous and brain spotting and, um, somatic experiencing therapy are kind of the ones that have been around for a little while. Um, one of the things, for such as for EMDR, and I, again, I mean, I saw it as the, the miracle. Um, something that I noticed that EMDR, there's miracle, there's magic with uh, tangible traumas that have been physical mm. accidents or, um, you know, physical abuse or sexual abuse and things that are physical. It wasn't necessarily dismantling core beliefs when it wasn't physical, you know, mm. it was perceptual concept, you know, what we call the big T's and the small T's. And uh, with the small T's, which were a lot of the core beliefs of perceptual, let's say, you know, a child thought they were abandoned because their mother was in there right away giving them something, um, wasn't necessarily dismantling those beliefs. Um, Mm. It wasn't dismantling core beliefs. It was dismantling the the trauma uh, effect on the body and the psyche. So I remember as I was, you know, doing the work, I kept thinking, you know, some of these core beliefs that came from childhood, they just weren't dismantled. Mm -hmm. And part of the way I came up with the process of um, looking at the, the, um, the memory to look at uh, the emotion and the, the, so it's the emotion where it's stored in the body. And then the core belief that is attached to and then going to the memory from the body, but awareingly, because most of the time when we do EMDR, the client doesn't necessarily, is not taking responsibility of each and every memory that shows up because they're just getting released. Um, 
But this concept of going through the memory and then, you know, working through the memory and then, you know, letting it go and releasing and then integrating who you are today with that, it appears that it's dismantling the negative core beliefs, which is a little bit different with the effect of uh, the EMDR. Absolutely. Yes, that is a very good point. Yeah, EMDR definitely relieves that somatic and subjective distress from um, physical uh, accidents, issues, things like that, and and some psychological. But you're right. There are often beliefs that hang on, even if the distress is gone, from the feeling of distress. And I've definitely noticed that. So I think a lot of practitioners who are more eclectic have have done... I don't know, sort of their own versions of trying to figure out how to dismantle those. But I like that your model has it basically drawn out. Like, okay, let's do the EMDR now. Let's address these beliefs that are tied to the memory for whatever reason on a deeper level and a long-term level so that we can flip those to be something that's more adaptive and useful to your life right now. And so I think that's key. Part of that, Paul, has to do also with when you when you go through the work of co- co- going into the memory of an event the experience and what that child perceived at that time is very important but then when i used to do psychodynamic and my own therapist was psychodynamic so i went through therapy as a client of a psychodynamic um, and then I went through therapy. I kept changing therapists to just experience different uh, types. What I even remember was that we would go to the ther- we would go to the trauma, we would go to the experience of the child, there would be catharsis, and then that's where it would end. Mm. So the piece that I'm also one that I'm adding is going to the original memory that we made that up. Mm. And then when the child is in that place, to take ownership that that's what they perceived. It's an ownership of, I made this up. Not that I made up the event. Right. But I made up whatever I made up out of it. The conclusion, yeah. That's the conclusion that became a belief. Yes. The conclusion, the decision I made that decision. Like I remember even going through these things about, you know, all the stuff that I had about my mother. The epiphany was at one point that I said that I saw, I kept saying my mother didn't love me. The epiphany was at one point that it was like, oh, I said my mother doesn't love me because at that moment I hated what she did. And I projected that. And then from there I decided. I'm not going to love you. There's a, there's a, you know, that epiphany that happens that I made up something and then I ran my life based on what I made up is really freeing. Yes. And then thinking who the adult is now to the child from their future and saying, I'm your future. I'm here. Like most of the stuff that their child was worried about is proven that it's not there. So, and then linking the two together. So those are the components of that work, which become had it differently a little bit with the psychodynamic or the EMDR and all of those that I had experienced as a client and as a therapist. So these were the, because I kept saying, you know, we keep doing this. I was famous in my, uh, in my town for doing deep work and complex work. Like all the other therapists who just got there, so they would send them to Fuja. So <laughs> 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 to Fuja because I did deep work. And this was the concept that kept, wait, why do I have to take the clients and kind of like re-traumatize them? Mm-hmm. Nothing changes. I mean, they all cry a lot, but, and I, you know, and I sit there and validate them and love them but it just doesn't change anything. And this was my biggest frustration through the years until this piece, you know, kind of like finally in, in my own work with myself of constantly going in and going in, it was like, what's the difference? And it's like, well, I think our memories are set up in a particular way. And then through, you know, through our mind, we have access to some memory. So when you say to someone, well, when is the you know, first time you thought about that? 
the person goes through their thought process and picks up something, but that picking up something from the past is still based on our own perceptual concepts. So it's different when it's said, you know, uh, when you say to this, like when you say I'm bad, what do you, how do you feel? Where is it in your body? Now allow your body, your muscle memory, your cells in your body, this emotion take you to the first time. And when you allow this, the body and emotion take you to the first time, completely you have other memories show up mm -hmm. that are not part of your like filing system of memories that you already have. And those memories are usually the ones that you created the, the decision-making process. And when you have that decision-making process, and then that's where the, the person takes ownership of, that's when I made this up. It's not the truth. I made this up. Again, I'm not suggesting the truth is not that your mother didn't hit you or so-and-so didn't molest you. That's not what I'm saying. But with all the events that happened, there was, I was a co-creator of that. I said something about myself and the world at that moment. And I need to take ownership of, I, I got that, I made that up. And then have been living with that all my life. I really like, I really that, like that because I feel like not only does it go beyond some of the places, like you said, like, well, I've, I feel like I've healed from this trauma, but I don't. I'm not changing my behavior in my, in my current decision-making process. I feel like it actually gives you back an element of control. And I yeah. think a, a big part of trauma is powerlessness. Um, somebody wronged me. Uh, the world wronged me. I got caught in the wrong situation and it's all out of your control. And so we do have to heal from that because, well, it actually was out of your control, but the belief that got integrated at the moment or right after the trauma or whatever it was, you actually can. I, I love that. That's it's just really going off in my mind as this missing element. I I was there and I decided that. And I decided it based on where I was emotionally, where I was cognitively, how old I was, my understanding of the world. I don't have to live with that anymore. I that I can choose to see that I was responsible for that belief showing up and that it really gives me more power now to say I, I don't want to keep reliving this negative core belief in my behaviors and my relationships in my workplace and what I do and even in my own mind what what's going on I I really think that is a an element that I honestly have not heard before <laughs> to be honest like I'm I'm saying it right here on this podcast I've heard some hints of that from some of the kind of the uh, mindfulness community a little bit about like trying to take responsibility for your thoughts now, even if you're depressed or anxious, but I haven't really ever heard of somebody taking responsibility for the moment that they have the cognitive distortion that they then integrate into a core belief. So I actually really appreciate that. I feel like that actually needs to be broadcast. So the fact that that's part of your model and your book, I think is great because as a therapist, that's actually helping myself conceptualize of that, that kind of that missing piece instead of just going, okay, well, I know it wasn't my fault or, you know, this is just the way the world works and it sucks and things happen and I can let that go and heal. I can go further than that. I can say, okay, how do I want to show up? Because this belief based on that thing I've healed from is still bothering me. And now I can take responsibility and say, yeah, I can, forgive myself. I can drop it. I can say no more to that. So I love that. Thank you for that. Yeah, looking at, um, how, for example, if I'm like, you know, 58 going back and I made a decision at age three to also look at and connect with that child uh, as, as is going, it's like after three, when I made that decision, like I made a decision, for example, I was molested at age three. So I made a decision, you know, I don't trust men. So the conversation of, I made that up. And then look at the resiliency that I had through that, through my relationships with people at work and, you know, we're all men, um, relationships and all of that. The areas that I did utilize that type of a behavior of like the, the belief system that I don't trust someone. And then yet all, even with that, 
how I survived to this age. How were my relationships? So it's like taking accountability not only for that, but also taking accountability for both routes of how that belief system stopped me some places and how my resiliency and coping mechanisms have supported me through the years. And that's where the, the, the concept of powerfulness instead of the powerlessness shows up as I take account of also all the areas that although I was abused, I, although all that happened, guess what? I survived it all. And then I turned out pretty okay, you know? And that piece, it's like at one point, instead of damning ourselves constantly in that victimized group place, I watched, I watched myself and my clients at one point, like their shoulders goes back, their heads comes up and it's like, yeah. I did that. You know, it's like really owning your resiliency. And I, that's the piece of the transformation and the integration. That I don't have to be that anymore. But it's no longer about, oh, I am that, but I don't have to be that anymore in the future. And I don't know what it is. But it's, hey, it's already 50 years of me doing that also. So look at the positive aspects of how I've grown, all the achievements I've made, everything that I've already done. Look at those strengths also. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's all encompassing and being able to look at your life in a larger lens. And so when you can do that in the model with a the therapist, then you can actually... We, we stop our negative bias a little bit about um, all of the problems and also looking at how much we have grown and how we survived. And that can be very empowering and bringing back our personal power and autonomy in, in ways that will make you feel more healthy. Even if there's a lot of things in life, obviously, tons of things in life we can't control, we can control we can work on our reactions and our resiliency along the way. And, and part of that is understanding where you, where we did come from and, and how, how we survived it. Yes. So I love that. And I think that uh, that's the part I, what the therapists and the coaches do. It's that they remind us and take us through this path of um, allowing us to really be in the space of, the vulnerable side, like containing us there, loving us there, accepting us in that mode um, so that we can be there, do the catharsis, take in ownership of the thought process. And, you know, the therapist and the coach kind of guide them. Like, you, you know, you really said that about yourself at that moment. Like with these kind of just seeding um, sentences, while this happened, and you really said that about yourself. Or like the sentence you said, I said, you know, the world is like that. Oh, well, it sucks. Oh, it, okay. It really means like you really said that about the world from there on. And how was it for you to live in that world? Because you said the world is not fair and sucks. Now we go into the world for the rest of our life with this belief system, you know? So it's the, the therapist is guiding also the person to become own, owner of these belief systems and then guiding them to come back and saying, you know, now that you're sitting here, uh, I want you now to go back to that child and say, I'm coming from your future. And um, I promise you a lot of these worries you've had, you know, the world has, has been sometimes bad, but the world has also been great in this, this, this mode. So the belief system, you, you said that I'm a victim of the world and the world is sucks and I just have to take it. I just want to tell you from 30 years ahead of you that the world sucked in these ways and the world was amazing in these ways. And guess what? We made it through. So it's that piece of integration and the, all of it that yes, the world sucks at times and it's, like, you know, it's great. And I don't, I, you know, my belief systems can be fluid versus stuck and rigid into something that I can't really allow my behavior to assess because when I'm fluid, then I can assess what's in front of me, what works best at this point, what belief system are useful in here, what thoughts and emotions and behaviors are useful at this point versus getting stuck in a, you know, 10 commandment that that's all I said, that's all I'm going to work with. 
I love that. And yeah, honestly, I can't think of any better way to summarize the work that you're doing and that we're all doing as therapists. And I really hope that, um, you know, a lot of people hear this because I think that you've provided fantastic tools and models for this. And so I really am, yeah, I'm glad to have you on the show, Fujian. And I want to, I, I'm going to definitely put your information in the link that people can click, but I want to know from you, what's your preferred method of contact for people? Um, my um, email, fujanzain at gmail.com. My website is fujan.com. Um, and um, those are the best ways to contact me. My social media is, you know, Dr. Fujan Zain. I'm on uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter. Um, I, have a, I have a show in ABC, uh, KMET, uh, 1490 AM, which is also goes on podcasts. So people can you know, listen to it live or uh, they can listen to my podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, which I also interview a lot of, um, you know, amazing authors and uh, people who created theories uh, in, you know, life sciences, let's say. And I would love to have you on my show, obviously. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, so uh, that's the way to uh, contact me. We are, uh, we have a very simple right now um website um which is awarenessintegration.com which i'm you know revamping and putting all this stuff um that we're doing in there too but that's not kind of like ready ready yet um but fujan.com says you know it has all of the uh, information and and conversations i've had about the ai model also there i love that so i'm going to put all that information and uh your bio in the show notes for this episode and it's been great having you on the show and i'm really glad that we met and i'm looking forward to continuing uh, a dialogue absolutely and thank you for the opportunity it's been great conversing with you thank you so much Hush, don't you cry. There you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast with Paul Krauss. If you're enjoying this show, please share it with people you know and subscribe. I would surely appreciate it. Until next time on the Intentional Clinician, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week. If you are searching for electronic medical records, I recommend Simple Practice. If you are interested in trying out Simple Practice, I have a link in the notes of this episode for a 30-day free trial. If you utilize the link I provided and decide to subscribe, this podcast will get a small referral fee. I thank you in advance. If you are a therapist, please join your local counseling association or whatever group you subscribe to and the national one. There have been many issues with people not getting access to quality mental health care in many different states. The Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association is working to increase the availability of quality mental health services statewide, increasing education, and promoting best practices to keep licensed professional counselors and other professionals accessible by the public. You can learn more about why that's important in episode 32 and 33 of this podcast. I'm also a member of the Arizona Counselors Association. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest. And while these are based upon literature they have read and their experience in the field, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area at Health for Life Grand Rapids, also known as the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids. You can find us on the internet by Googling those terms or going to www.healthforlifegr.com. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for listening.